good morning. I welcome you to our morning worship here at Bethel United Church of Christ in Evansville, Indiana. I'm Reverend Samuel Buer, and I'm pleased to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, here in this place where we strive to be united in seeking God's will and in serving all of God's people. We welcome all who are guests, members, and friends as we gather for worship this morning. If you'd like to learn more about us, be sure to go to BethelUCC.org or follow us on Facebook at Bethel UCC Evansville. That's all one word. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time and, and, and you are in the Evansville area, I invite you to join with us for worship on Sunday mornings in our parking lot at 10, 15 a.m., weather permitting. We we'll continue to do all of our ministries as best we can in this time. We've been serving uh, uh, or, or hosting weekly meals at United Caring Services for homeless. We've been doing that for several months for now uh, and other ministries as well. So we encourage you to continue giving uh, your gifts during this pandemic season. Let us worship God. Amen. I invite you to join with us now in the call to worship and those that have bulletins with them, please join along. The buzz of the world interrupts our lives and fills our ears. Call us into your way of life, O oh God. The complaints of others settle in our mind and cloud our vision. Lead us into your vision of life, O oh God. The cries of the poor, the oppressed and the outcast pierce our hearts. Guide us in your example of living for others, O God. Fill our hearts, fill our eyes, fill our ears with your love, O God. Let us be your hands and feet in the world, O God. Let us worship you together. Join me for the prayer of discipleship. Holy One, you promised to be with us and long ago sent your spirit to abide among us and guide us to a future of goodness and hope. We come seeking your truth, your justice, and your kindness. O oh God, you are with us in the morning. Let us feel your presence as we welcome you into our lives. Come and fill these desires of our hearts, we humbly pray. Amen. Please listen as I read the scriptures for today. The first one is from Exodus 16, 2 to 15. 
The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they pre prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we? that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Our second scripture comes from Matthew 20, 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others still standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the, le into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily, daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give it to the last the same as I give to the first. Let's prepare now to hear God's word preached this day. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in high school, I landed a summer job at a sewage treatment plant. That summer job carried over into the next summer. And the boss was gracious enough to keep me on every summer during my college years. And then when I went off to seminary, he kept me on during those summers as well. He was so gracious to me that if I was home during winter or spring break at all, if I just even showed up for one day, he, he allowed me to work. I didn't even have to call ahead. Needless to say, I was so thankful for his generosity. As a result, every day that I showed up, I made sure that I put in a good day's work. Between high school and college, I worked there for one full year, and it was during that year that it became readily apparent to me, as it was already apparent to my coworkers, that one of the employees was not carrying his weight. Whenever the work became too difficult or too dirty, he would find a reason to disappear. And here I was, receiving a part-time wage and working my tail off, and he was receiving a full-time wage, but not putting in a full day's work. This would go on day after day, month after month. There were certain days I knew that when I got to work, I would know that in about an hour, that fellow would hop in the truck and disappear into town and not come back for several hours. Because we all knew what the work was for that day. And he'd find a way out. Although I was grateful for the job, that experience was so frustrating that on several occasions by the end of summer, I was so glad to get back to college, to get back, to get back to school. Was that coworker lazy? Oh, yes, he was. There were some eight hours days where the amount of work that he completed in that day could have been done in one hour. Why he wasn't called out for his laziness, I'll never know. The experience of that coworker not pulling his weight was over 35 years ago. Have I forgotten it? No. Do I still have feelings about it? Oh, yes, I do. So now, when we read of the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, almost whenever I read that parable, I remember my experience with my coworker. In my mind, he was very much like that worker who only worked for one hour but got paid for the full day. Whereas I was the worker that had worked for all day long. But in my case, instead of receiving a full day's wage, I only got a part-time wage. The feelings of frustration that I still carry from that time clearly aligns me more closely with those workers in today's parable who complained about what they saw as unfair. Life was not fair to me when I was that part-time employee. I was putting in a full day's work but being paid way less than that full-time employee who was blowing off the better part of the day. Compare this to today's parable. The parable, which is masterfully told, has been strategically placed in Matthew so that no one would miss its significance. In chapter 19, the previous chapter, the rich young ruler asked Jesus what he must do to have eternal life. And Jesus responds with an answer that should make every middle-class Christian shudder. He says, give everything you have away. Of course, the young man goes away grieving, 
for he had many possessions. We're to assume he never gave any away. It seems as though the young man had labored all day like some of the workers in Jesus' parable, keeping the commands of the Torah while at the same time amassing possessions and wealth. He had done nothing wrong. Yet he still missed the point. God's generosity surpasses that which we can earn. Let me say it again. God's generosity surpasses that which we can earn. It is precisely God's generosity that such a person can be free to give up. Because of God's generosity, such a person can be free to give up her or his worldly possessions. That story is closely followed by a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Peter tries to one-up the young man and says to Jesus, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have in the kingdom? Peter's rash assertion belies that he too has missed the point. For apparently God is not in the business of keeping score. Jesus tells his disciples that in God's kingdom, with God's economics, many who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. It's in this context in Matthew that Matthew then relates the story of the workers in the vineyard. Now, you would think that the disciples would have gotten the point. Amazingly, right after this parable, the mother of the sons of Zebedee asked Jesus for her two sons permission to sit at his right hand and at his left hand in his kingdom. It's another example of the all-too-human desire to somehow earn the gifts we seek from God. But Jesus, of course, will have None of that. The signs of God's abundance, radically reordering generosity, are scattered throughout, the, throughout like seeds throughout Matthew. Just read the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. Or read the parable of the sower in chapter 13. Or the parable of the unforgiving slave in chapter 18. And today's passage And many others show how the kingdom of heaven is characterized by a different economics than our earthly society. In our economic system, for several decades now, the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. It appears that our system is based upon the assumption that God only helps those who help themselves. And by the way, did you know that's not in the scripture, although many think it is? There is no place in the scripture where it is said, God helps those who help themselves. It is not a part of the gospel. That assumption has no place in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the gospel that Jesus tells, God helps all people, especially especially those who cannot help themselves. In today's parable, we learn that those that worked just one hour were paid the same amount as those who had worked the full day. But now, here we are 2,000 years removed from the story. And what many of us may not be aware is that a full day's wage and it was paid at the end of the day. You didn't get, receive payment for your wages every other week. But you received it every day at the end of the day. A full day's wage was just enough to feed your family for that day. And to house the family for that day. What Jesus is saying has less to do with fairness, 
about being paid a fair wage for a fair day's work, as it is making sure that in the world that he imagines, that at the end of the day, no family will go to bed hungry. In his world, God's generosity will make sure that no one goes hungry. The world that Jesus envisioned and imagined is very different than the world in which he lived and the world in which we live. In our world, right here in Vandenberg County, on any given day, over 20% of our children from zero through 18 do not have enough food for the day. 20%, more than 20% will go to bed hungry tonight here in Evansville. Jesus would have something to say about that. He imagined a world where no child would go to bed hungry. And just as he was concerned about making sure that people were well fed, we have countless stories of Jesus healing one person after another. Jesus was as generous with his healing gifts as was the vineyard owner in his parable with the wages for those who worked only one hour. I can only begin to imagine what Jesus might have to say about our current discussions on health care. Clearly, Jesus was concerned about health care for the least of these as he healed children and women, the blind, the lame. I would suspect that he would have something to say about a system that leaves people without adequate health care just as he had something to say in his day about a system that left people without adequate food. Now, although I began the sermon addressing the issue of fairness, the main concern about both the Exodus story of the manna and the parable that Jesus told have less to do with fairness than they have to do with God's generosity. In the case of the Israelites in the wilderness, they had done nothing to earn the gift of food for each day. In the parable that Jesus told, according to the standards of our world, the worker that only toiled for one hour had not earned his keep either. Clearly the message both storytellers are wanting us to hear is that God's generosity is not bound by the standards of our world or our economic systems. Therefore, as children of God, as children of the kingdom, our generosity must also not be bound by the standards of this world. Today, as we near the end of September, we're entering a season of harvest. We're also entering a season of stewardship. These two texts challenge me, and I trust they challenge you to consider what it means to be a child this, of this God whose generosity knows no bounds. If we take these stories seriously and become more generous with our treasure, more generous with our time, more generous with our talents, just maybe those who look to us for guidance might tell stories of how generous we were with all that God had given to us. Maybe the next time I read this parable, instead of closely identifying with the worker that toiled all day, just maybe, by the grace of God, I might naturally identify more closely with the generous boss. I pray. Amen. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? 
and what's on the other side. Rainbows are visions, but only illusions, and rainbows have nothing to hide. So we've been told. Some choose to believe it, and I know they're all wait and see. Someday we'll find it the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. Who said that every Let us now turn our hearts towards prayer. Let us pray. O God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You invite us to extend that love to the world around us, to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. And so we bring the needs of our world before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the many who do not have enough, enough food to eat or shelter to keep warm, enough employment or money to pay their bills, enough medicine or medical care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray for those who have more than enough, but who still struggle to find meaning and purpose in life who indulge in dangerous or self-serving activities to dull their pain or loneliness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, your grace reaches out to all of us. You call us to live as citizens of heaven, working together with one heart and mind. Strengthen us to live in a manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives in service of your kingdom, where the last are first, and the first are last, and there is grace enough for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now be in a time of silence.
And now let us join together in the prayer that our Savior has taught us as we pray. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is, it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. debtors. And lead, and lead us, us not, not into temptation, but deliver, but deliver us from evil. evil. For, For thine, thine is the kingdom and, and the power and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Join me in the unison prayer for dedicating our generosity. Great God of heaven and earth, you call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, maybe even complacent in our present. May this act of giving be a gesture of our willingness to follow where you lead. Amen. Let's turn now to the benediction. Creator God, may your peace go with us wherever we will be this day. May you guide us through the challenges, protect us when in need, and inspire us with your love. May we acknowledge your presence in all the human goodness we will see. May you bring us back rejoicing to our places of rest this night. This service has ended. Your service now begins. Go with the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>